So what we're going to do is by the end of this evening, I'm going to try to help you figure out how to use those numbered charts to spell chords. I'll give you enough background and harmony to be able to figure your way through some. But I cannot. I mean, just the study of harmony alone, just spelling the chords, would take another four weeks. You know, all I can do is kind of show you how to figure figure out what to call them and kind of how they work together, you know, and what they do together, kind of analyzing them a little bit, breaking them down, making them a little easier, but I can't get into a long-winded discussion on how to use them. Okay. back to here for our reviews. We learned that in different keys, the different sharps and flats, all those things meant was they told you where to figure out where one was. And once you figured out where one was, what that did is that helped you figure out where the packets are. And once you know where the packets are, you can begin reading chromatically. Now the main point of this class is to teach you diatonicism, diatonic chords and do re mi -ism. That's a start. So I'm from that, you can learn chromaticism, or how to deal with all 12 notes. And I'm giving you some background on what's a major, what's a minor, what's an augmented, what's a diminished, what does that mean? So now let's go back here to where I said, if you just didn't know anything about chromaticism, all you knew was do, re, mi, and all you could do is play music in one key, that would be enough to play most music. And you could, whatever, regardless of what key it's written in, once you figure out where one is, and one can only start on a line or start on a space, either one. It's going to start on a line, it's going to start on a space. And if you figure out how to read one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, by starting on a line or starting on a space, you'll have the job down. When we're doing melodies, since this is about melody, we only use the numbers one through seven because the melodic pattern of the scale repeats or goes over. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, so, repeats after seven notes. And because it's seven and it's an odd number, the lines and spaces shift around once you get past an octave. Most singing happens within the octave. Most composers, when you write melodies, will not write a melody that jumps an octave. It might jump a third or a fourth or a fifth sixth, even a seventh, but rarely will a composer write a piece of music for someone to sing that's going to jump more than an octave. So learning to read in one octave well, in those seven notes well, is the first key to learning to read better. Okay? The next thing is learning to read two octaves. Now when you read two octaves worth of music, you have two points of view. One point of view again is the melodic point of view. And that is, you're going to, if one starts on a line, let's say, and as we go up, one, three, five, seven, eight, then shifts to a space. And now all the spaces going up are going to be odd numbers. So if you learn to do that, you can learn to read most melodies, pack them out and figure out with no problems. And there again, you're only using the numbers one through seven. But if you want to read harmonies, Harmonies, or uh, chords, are usually written in groups of thirds. That means they go from line to line to line to line, or space to space to space to space, groups of thirds, and often are extended beyond an octave. When you've got four people singing, and each person has a one octave range, you have a possibility of three or four octaves that you can get those people to sing in. So composers had to develop the grand staff. They had to develop the treble clef and the bass clef and put the two together in order to express four-part harmony with four people because of a wide range, okay? 
Also because of the spacing of the people's voices, they were able to pull the notes apart. Instead of singing the three notes close to each other, the way we've been writing them, they could spread the three notes out over their four or five octave range and have this spread voicing. And because of the spread voicing, they used harmonic notes that, where you can read up to the number 13. They read one, two, three, uh, one, three, five, seven. Then the next one, instead of being two, would be nine, then 11, then 13. And number 15 is number one, two octaves later. So they don't use numbers bigger than 15. So you can have a 13th, a 14th chord, a 13th chord, an 11th chord, a 10th chord. You can have a 7 through 14 chord. So anywhere in that area. And they would use the numbers up to 14. But all those numbers have enharmonic numbers. That means the number 11 is really the number 4, the fourth step of the scale stretch out past an octave. The number nine is really the number two. So a ninth in music is the same as the second step of the scale. And you can add a ninth to your chord not by going up nine notes, but by adding the second. And you're playing a ninth chord. So because of writing chords, they extended it through two octaves and they used the numbers up to 13. And you just have to learn to translate in your head. Music theory is more perfect than music. That is, because it's theory, just like math, I can get the new nominology up here. I can get the, these uh, symbols, which follow certain rules of mathematics, to do anything I want, even if it's not possible to do it in real life. Because the symbolism is so perfect, I can describe things that happen in real life. But also because it's so perfect, I can describe things that don't happen in real life. In other words, I can create things in music theory that are just pure music theory that, if you played them, might sound just like something else. And we call, again call that enharmonic. Anytime in music I write something in a certain key, let's say, say I write something in a key and when I play it, it sounds like a Sounds like an ordinary C major chord to you with no sharps or flats on it, but the way it's written, it looks like it's got 10 flats, you know? And you play it, it sounds like C. That's what we mean by enharmonic. If, if it sounds like C, it is C. But we only have five sharps and flats on the piano, right? Besides the seven notes, there's 12 half, half steps. Okay, I can only add five sharps and then any number of sharps past five, obviously, that is going to be an enharmonic key to something without all this. I mean, I can't add more than five sharps in real life. But in music theory, I could have 25. I could have a key with 25 sharps. And I could write a piece in a key with 25 sharps. Although, we don't have any more than five on the piano. You see what I'm getting at? Music theory is so perfect in that sense that if I extend the theory as far as I want, I can write things theoretically that sound just like ordinary things. <laughs> sound just like something else that might be simpler. The reason they don't write it simpler is because they're stuck with the theory. You see, once you extrapolate a theory, you say, oh, this is true because of such and such, you have to stick to those rules. And so sometimes something looks awkward. It, there might be an awkward construction of the music grammar up here to you. It seems, oh, gee, that has a double sharp, you know, on it. But it doesn't need a double sharp because it sounds like a neutral note. And you, you might think, well, it'd be easier to write it as a neutral note. Well, maybe it would be easier to write it as a neutral note. But in music theory, because of the key you started writing the thing in, you have to call out a double sharp something. You see? Is and this is where the... Can keys? And you can't write down in theory that you switch? Yes, you can. You can switch keys, but then your notes would all move and everything would look different. You'd have to notate, you change the key signature. Sometimes it's not practical to do that for just one or two notes. You might have one or two notes that are triple sharped. So one make, that's double you flatted. You notes in, a, in the same key, the notes in a different key. Perfectly. Right. So, it's, so once you add more than five sharps, 
in any key signature, the sixth sharp that you add is just theoretical at that point. And it would sound like something else. Do you do that when you modulate so, the left? Well, I can have as many sharps for flats as I want. I can modulate into any key. There's 12 half steps, so I could theoretically modulate into 12 different keys. You know, and then you figure take those 12 keys, if I double sharp them, then that gives me 24 more possibilities, doesn't it? But I only have five sharps or flats on the piano. If I only have five sharps or flats, how can I write in 25 different keys? Well, I can do that because I can extend music theory as far as I want to take it. As long as I follow the rules of my extension, then it will hold up. It will hold up. But what I'm writing might look like a very clumsy, very difficult to read. It might be perfect, but it doesn't make it easy. That's what I'm saying. And the same with flats. I mean, the most flats that I can add are five flats. If I write something in six flats, or if I write something in seven flats, it's going to sound just like some simpler key. It's going to sound like C. Right. Once I get past a few flats. You know. Why don't they just write sharps and flats as notes? We do that now. That's what's happening. More and more composers are just using the key of C and they are putting down the accidentals where they use the accidentals and aren't trying to notate them as anything special. I'm taking it a step farther. I'm, I'm saying if you learn to read by interval the way I'm teaching you, you can get rid of sharps and flats altogether. You don't need to use them except when they do not occur in the natural key. So that when you see one, you deal with it. When you don't, you don't think about it. And that makes more sense to me. Now, if I were to uh, try to write up here on the board this thing in the key of F, I'd have to put in, I mean, in the key of E, I'm sorry. I'd have to put in an F sharp, a C sharp, a G sharp, and a D sharp. That would be the key of E. And what that means is that this last sharp here, that, that point right there, and then if I count down, that point right there becomes one. So in the key of E, the bottom line of the staff, the normal music staff, is one. Okay? And the key of E has four sharps in it. Now that I know that, I can figure out where the packets would be. Well, if this is one, two, three, four, between three and four is where this packet lies. Four, five, six, seven, and eight. And between seven and eight is where this packet lies. Now, once I know that, I can just do away with the sharps altogether. It doesn't matter if they're there or not. As a matter of fact, I don't need anything else at this point. Once I know where these packets are, it doesn't matter whether there were sharps or flats over here or not. Uh, I know that this is where one is, and I know there's packets there. Now I can begin to build scales, modes, pentatonic scales, or write harmonies based on what's in those charts. For instance, let's write us an 11 chord. Since this is the key of E, it will be called an E11 chord. Okay? All it means is one, two, one, three, five, seven, nine, at a ledger, eleven. Okay, that's some kind of E11 chord. Just doing that. Some kind of E11 chord. One, three, five, seven, nine. You can see I just built it up in thirds. Now to figure out where it's, whether it's a perfect E11 chord, I have to know if the half steps, if the major and minor stuff are happening in the right place. Well, look at your little chart. What does it say an 11 chord has to have on your little chart? It would be two for the octave and one for the interval, like a fourth or a third. Oh, 
okay. Here, it just says 11. See there where, where it says 11? It says 1, 3, 5, 7, flat, 9, 11. Okay, 1, 3 means, since it has no flats on it, that means that's a major third. 1 to 3 would be a major third. So, in major thirds, is there a packet in the third, if it's a major third? No. So let's look at this third here. Is there a packet in it? No. So that is a major third. That is a, that's a major third. There's no packet. So that fits it. That qualifies. Okay, the next interval should be a perfect fit. Now, where are they measuring this from? They're always measuring it from the bottom note. Whenever you do harmony, you always measure it from the bottom note. So that means from here to the next note there has to be a perfect fifth. Well, it's one, three, five. It's definitely a fifth. Now, is it a perfect fifth? In order to be a fifth, it must have one packet. Does it have one packet? Yes, it does have one packet. Therefore, it's a perfect fit. So, so far, we're spelling this chord right. Okay, the next interval is a seventh, but it is not a major seventh. It's a flatted seventh. That means it's minor. It's smaller than major. In order to be a minor seventh, one, three, five, seven. In order to be a minor seventh, a major seventh has one packet in it. Okay? Well, this has one packet in it, so it must be a major seven. How can I make it smaller? It should have two packets in it in order to be minor. So how can I make that note smaller? Flat. Yeah, if I lower the top note by flatting it, I've now made that a minor seven. And that, since it is a flatted seven, so in other words, from here to here, with one packet in it, makes it a major seventh, a normal seventh. And I have to take some, some frequency away from it, so I lowered it to make it minor. So it's now a minor seventh. So, since it's a minor seventh, that note's okay. Then the next note that's added is a ninth, and that's a major ninth. Now, what you don't know is a major ninth, in order to be a major ninth, must have two packets, because it's just like the number two, a major second, with an octave. An octave must have two packets, plus the major second, with no packets, means my ninth should have just two packets. So one, three, five, seven, nine, there's one packet, there's two packets, I have two packets for my octave, and the second is fine. Another way of seeing that is this is eight, that would be two, a major second. And it has from here eight or one to there two, which is my ninth, is no, there's no half step, so it's a major second. So a major second plus an octave is nine. So that's fine, don't have to change that. And then the next one is the 11, and it's a major 11. Sometimes they add sharp elevenths or sharp ninths or flatted elevenths, so that's flatted ninths, you'll see in there. When you're doing a chord on naturel, like C11 or B11, the only note that's normally minor is the seventh. And that would be true no matter how far you extend it. So here, this has to be an eleventh. An eleventh in, is the fourth step of the scale, so it's a perfect fourth. The eleventh does not have major and minor. The eleventh only can be augmented or diminished because it's another kind of fourth. And fourth is a perfect interval, which can be augmented. So you cannot have a minor eleventh or a major eleventh. This is a perfect eleventh. And it must be perfect. In order to be a perfect eleventh, how many half steps does a fourth have in it? One. One. And the octave has two. So there should be three half steps here. So let's see. I didn't carry this all the way through. Six, I mean seven, eight, which is one, two, three, to that line would be four. So hanging off of this ledger line is another packet. So hanging off of this ledger line there, this is one, two, three, four. Between this 
the top here and the next ledger line up, there is also another packet. The step of three to four. So that, from here to there, is a perfect fourth. It has a packet, and then you have your two for the octave. Or one, two, three packets for a perfect eleven. So it is a perfect eleven. Ergo, this is an E eleven chord. And I didn't have, it doesn't matter if the sharps are flats over here or what's going on. So what does it sound like? Oh, good question. just extend the numbers on going up and you can still use that chart no matter where I put a note here we should be able to build an 11th chord could we put our 9th and 11th in the same in our original lower octave yes down there. another way to write this would be I could take this note off of here and since the ninth is really another kind of two, right, I could put it right here. That's also a ninth chord. I mean, that's a, an eleventh chord. I can also remove the eleven from here, if I want close voicing, since it's another kind of fourth, and put it in there. Have you ever seen clusters like that in piano writing? That's what it is. And it looks like it's just every step of the scale, isn't it? One, two, three, four, five, seven flat. One, two, three, four, five, seven flat. further the spacing on them, then the overtones aren't so close to each other to warble. If they're spaced out further, further apart from each other, then the overtones that they interfere with are much higher up, and so that you don't detect as much warble. So the further you spread something, the more likely it is to harmonize. That's just a general rule. The more I can spread the voices, the more likely I am to get something that wouldn't normally harmonize close to sound harmonious. Because the overtones are further away from each other, so they're being affected much, much higher up, which means the power is less. Where if they're close together, the overtones just above each fundamental, they in wrestling with each other. You see. But this is also another way of writing an E11 chord. And this is perfectly legal way of writing it. And somebody, as a matter of fact, a composer would do that if they were not resting on the chord. If they wanted to give the feeling of E11, see, in a piece, but they knew that they were going to be going dee 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 and dee 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 and dee dee dee, they might be doing something like a, like a. Closer together, the more dissonant it gets, yes. Yes, that's why you know, these intervals of 1, 3, and 5 inside the scale are so important. They're so pure. They're so pure to be able to be so close to each other, still have the consonant effect that they have. And numbers that are right next to each other, 2s and 4s, stuff like that, have more tension in them because their overtones clash and they're so close that it makes a big effect. I'll get into that a little bit more, but I just wanted to show you by using that chart 
uh, it is possible to write a chord in any key, and you don't have to know whether there are sharps or flats over here or whatever, um, to do it with. This is perfectly legal, theoretically. Now, if I had not started on the first note, if I had not started in the key of E on the one, this chord would have been a lot harder to spell. For instance, what if I start here for my first note? Then this is my three, five, seven, nine, eleven. Now I've got to figure out whether the intervals are major or minor or whatever. Well here, from here to here, that's major, so I can leave that alone. This fifth has one packet in it, so that's perfect, I can leave that alone. Now this seventh has two, not one, but it has two half steps in it. So that seventh is not a major seventh, it's normally a minor seventh. So I don't have to flat it, I can leave that alone. And then going up here to the, to the next note is my ninth. And then looking at it, I've got one, two, three packets in there. And I should not have three packets, I should only have two for a ninth. A ninth is an octave plus a second. Second doesn't have a packet in it, and an octave has two. So that is too small. So what I have to do is sharpen that one to make it a major ninth rather than a flatted ninth or a minor ninth. And then my eleventh is perfect because it has three half steps in it. So you see this needed a sharp on it, on that step to make it an e, uh, some kind of an eleven chord. You see the packets caused the intervals in here to be different. So we had to use different accidentals to correct it. So does the seventh always have to be flat? The seventh? Yes. Uh, I'll explain why. But the seventh, whenever you add the seventh in a chord, the flatted seventh is the natural one. And every other note, the natural number would be the whole number. The number one, two, three, four, five, six. You use those whole numbers. Those are natural. A six chord, you use a whole six. A suspended chord, which is a four chord, you use a whole four. But, uh, but when you add the seventh of a chord, you always add the flatted because of this overtone series. The seventh division happens to be as B flat in this from C up here. You get a major chord, and the next interval that's added when you multiply seven, when you multiply any number by seven, is the B flat. The seventh son of a seventh son. If it's are not, they, do they call it a dominant seven? No, yes, they, they call it dominant. You dominate or major seventh, they say. Because would that's all alter. Dominant seventh, you use the flat and seventh too. If you ask for the for the major seventh, you have to specify that the seventh is major. If I ask for a C7 chord, then we assume the seventh is flatted. If I want it to be a major seventh, I'd have to say C major MAJ seventh. But only the seventh is what you have to do it for you. Have to right. The seventh is naturally flatted because in the natural overtone series, the seventh division or the seventh partial of the overtone begats you a minor seven rather than a major seven. And that's the next natural division of the string. That always comes in there. Always. That's the only one that does that. Only one that does that. So you have to notate it special when you don't want it to be that way. You want it to be more dominant. Now, getting into making up scales. Scales, as I mentioned last week, came from harmony, actually. And actually, all you need to know is the very first scale that was developed was by Pythagoras, the pentatonic scale. And I'm going to use my exaggerated staff here. Okay, let's say I make this X marks the spot. What happened was Pythagoras decided that he wanted to put together a scale. No, I'm better. For Pythagoras, I better move the X down here. Let's say 
X marks the spot. So when Pythagoras developed his scale, the first overtone gave him a note that was the same note, an octave. The third division of the string generated a new note, which was musically the fifth. So the fifth became uh, in the number five, which has a lot of metaphysics behind it anyway. The number five is pretty heavy in metaphysically, period, especially in Chinese medicine. And uh, what happened is they mystified that number, and he liked that number or that interval, so he used five fifths, five fives. So if we go up a fifth, and then from here, think of this relationship of one to five, think of this five as a new one, and then go up a fifth, and then think of this, this one as a new one, right, and go up a fifth, and then go up a fifth. If we do that one, two, three, four, if we do it five times, five fifths, we will have all the notes that Pythagoras used in his pentatonic scale. Now let's figure out what those notes are. Well, starting from here is ground one. One, three, five, six, seven, new one. This note is two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. That didn't work out. Five, seven, nine, thirteen, fifteen. That's right, that's three. I did it wrong then. One, two, Oh, I didn't need to go that high. I only need five notes, right? I didn't need to go that high. Only one, two, three, four, five notes. And this this note you'll see is the really the five of the five is the number two. And this number two that is the five of the five, or in Roman numerals, they'd call that the five of the five. That's real important to remember. That's magic, too. It's used in modulation a lot. And it, they call this a supertonic because of its relationship through five to one. And that's another, some more side trivia. But anyway, you have one, five, bringing this down. Two, transposing this down. Three, transposing the five over. Five, and transposing this down. Six, and there's one. One, two, three, five, six, eight, six, five, three, two, one. That is the pentatonic scale. You see? One, two, three, five, six, five, three, two, one. Came from moving up five, five, five. When we move up a fifth here, that note's five. We move up a fifth here to the ninth, that's a two. We move up a fifth again, we've moved to the sixth step of the scale. We move up again, we've moved to the third step of the scale. Do that with five notes, five fifths, you wind up with a pentatonic scale or all the black keys on the piano. Arranged one, two, three, five, six. Sounds like. Okay. This is, was the very first scale developed. And you see it's because of this relationship of the five being so important. We got these notes. But remember I said we got stuck with this gap here, and that gap there? And the gap is a minor third. That's a flat, the distance there is a minor third. Okay. That minor third, after hundreds of years, thousands of years almost, of seeing this darn thing, they argued about who sh who's going to land where in here. So 
far as the tuning was concerned. Finally, someone justified a way of explaining why we should fill these in by going back to this idea and saying, well, hey, this idea, the fifth on the fifth, is interesting, but what happens if we put just, what happens if I fill it in and make it a whole chord and add, put the three in there? What, what happens if I build from this chord up to here, but I add the, I add the third in there, making this a one, three, five chord? Now what happens is, lo and behold, look, I get a new note right there to fill that guy in with, right there. I've got that new note. Now maybe I can, uh, by adding a third to one of these guys, I can figure out a way to get, to get that in there. And sure enough, they found out that if they went down in the other direction and built a chord, that the new note that popped up filled in that spot. There's, and this is where one is. So this is our root chord, it's called. And what we did is we took the interval of the fifth and we filled it in with the third. In there, adding one, three, five, three, one, major chord. Now let's do what they did with Pythagoras. One, three, five, make this five a new one, three, five, three, one, three, five, three, one, five, three, one. One, three, five, one, three, five. And then let's go the other way. Let's build down. Let's make this one the five of something else and build down this way. One, five, three, one, three, five, one, three, five, one, three, five, three, one, five, three, one, five, three, one. I just sang all the notes in a diatonic scale. You know, off the top of my ear. Here's how you can do it. Let's figure out what they are. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Somehow we're going to get these notes are going to transpose into there. Let's see. We know this one is that there, and we know this one is that one there, and we know this one five is that one there. So we got those guys down. Okay. Counting backwards. One, Seven, that note is six of the scale, so we can fill in that. Five, four, so we can fill in the four. And going up, one, three, five, five, six, seven. So there's that one. One, two. So there's the two. Da, 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 da. And then of course another octave would be. So there we have. This, this guy is two. And this guy is seven. And this guy is six. Up here. And this guy is four. So relabeling these. One, three, five, seven, two, and six, four. 
See, this chord here created the 4, 6, 1. This chord here, your root chord, creates your 1, 3, 5 of the scale. And this one, 5, 7, 2, creates your 5, 7, 2 of the scale. All of those notes transposed into a single octave give you do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Now another thing to notice is, see this is the, this one here is the fourth step of the scale, and this one's one is on the fifth step of the scale. So this chord is often referred to in Roman numerals as a one chord to separate its chordness from its melodicness. So you know the difference between a melodic number and a chord number. Okay, it starts on the first step of the scale, one, three, five, and it's called a one chord. This one starts on the fourth step of the scale, four, six, one, and they call that a four chord, and they use the Roman numeral four to describe it. And this starts on the fifth step of the scale, and goes up 7, 2, and they call it a 5 chord. So the 1, 4, 5 chord, 1, 4, 5 chord, put together, make up the major scale if all these chords are major. That's how the major scale happens. Because this chord is ringing in the overtone here of that note. And in this note, this chord is ringing in the overtones of that note. And this chord here is ringing in the overtones of that note. And these guys have harmonic relationships to each other. Therefore, any chord that's a friend of this one is a friend of mine. That's the way that works. So these chords are, are interchangeable. And all the notes in the diatonic scale can be played in any one of these three chords. Now, if I want to give these chords names, if this is the key of C, then this would be the F chord, and this would be the G chord. So C, F, and G go together as a chord progression because of their relationship to each other in this situation here. And they also, you can play any note in the C scale along with either of these because they all in their overtones somehow or another bind together to create all those notes in that scale so you could play, pull, play any one of those notes against any one of these chords and then voila it'll sound good now if you use these for chord progressions and then use that scale what you're going to have is music if I play the C chord, I can play any white note I want. guys as chord progressions and using any of these notes as melodies you always harmonize with that chord progression. Indeed you'll find when you analyze most songs that most songs are made up of the one four five chord progression. Lots and lots and lots more than you can imagine. <laughs> and that all the notes that they use in the scale harmonize with those harmonies. Now I can invent other scales by changing this harmony. For instance, what if I only flatten the one chord and leave the other chords major chords and make this a minor chord? That means that here in this, in this thing, I'm going to take my third, and the difference between a major third and a minor third is that the third is flatted. So if I add that flat, put that flat right here. So one, two, 
three flat, four, five, six, seven, makes up some kind of a scale. And I could play any of these notes here with the three flat along with a C minor chord, an F major, or a G major chord. So if I play F major, G major, C minor, G minor. They add the G minor. Wouldn't you have to also flat the third for whenever you do the fourth and the, and the fifth? Too? No. Yeah, yeah, you'd use the flatted third for either of those. No, you could use the major, play these majors along with that flatted third. As a matter of fact, this particular scale is some kind of a scale. It is no longer a diatonic do re mi scale, is it? As a matter of fact, it has a name. only flat just the one chord, so the third is flatted, and the others are major, going up the scale, that is called a melodic minor. Does that move the packet down? Just on that one. No, it doesn't move the packet. That's why we had to add the flat. Since it doesn't move the packet, we had to add the accident, accidental, to show that it is actually smaller than it looks. It's really just a half step smaller than a normal third. So instead of going to where the three major would be, we go to... But then there isn't a packet between the third and the fourth anymore. No, there's still a packet between the third and the fourth. There's still a packet there. And that's showing that uh, it's flatter than it would normally be. See, so if I put a packet in there, now is that a major second or a minor second? Well, when the packet was in there, it was a minor second, wasn't it? But now that this note's been flatted, it's bigger, one half step larger. So now that's a major second. So the packets in there and the flat added together make that a major second now, which it is. Stepping from E flat to F is a whole step, as opposed to going from E to F, was. which was a half step. I thought that's what a packet meant. Was it? It's a natural half step, which doesn't move. It's always there. And I change the half step relationships on the staff by adding sharps and flats. The packet's still there, though, still representing itself. That's why the sharps and flats make sense. If I remove the packet or change the packet, then how would I know what the sharp or flat means? Why did I put the flat in there? I obviously, I put the flat in there because there was a half step there. But I, did, I can't see on the graph that it's really in there. Okay, um, so going up the scale, that's called a melodic minor. When you come down the scale, though they don't play that coming down the scale for melodic minor, what they do is coming down the scale, since you're moving down, they flat all the notes. Since you're moving up, they flat only this, but then since you're coming down, they want these guys, uh, six and seven, to also be flatted. So they flat all the notes. They flat all three chords. So you have three flat, you flat that third, you've got seven flat. You flat this third, you've got six flat. So if I add six flat and seven flat, like that, the three flats, for all three flat chords, I now have what is called a natural minor. If all three chords are naturally minor, then the scale that it produces is a natural minor scale. And again, I can play all three of these chords in any minor form I want, and all these notes will harmonize against it. If I only flat the one chord and the four chord, but leave the flat off of the five chord, so I only have the third step of the scale and the sixth step of the scale flatted, that is called a harmonic minor. 
scale. And if I only flat the one chord and not the four or five going up, where only three is flatted, I have what's called a melodic minor. So here are one, two, three different kinds of minor scales. And the reason that there's three different minor scales is because I can flatten or not flatten these three chords. If all three of these chords are major, then the scale it produces is a major scale. If one of these chords has been flattened, then the scale it produces is some kind of minor scale. This one produces the melodic minor. Flatting the one and the four chord produces the harmonic minor. Flatting all three of them produces the natural minor. That's where they got the words from. I often wondered why there was three different minor scales and why they had three different names and where the names came from. It wasn't until I learned this that it made sense to me where they came, where the names came from. The reason the natural minor is called natural minor is because all three chords are naturally flatted. The reason the harmonic is called harmonic is because the relationship of one to five has not been disturbed, as you have in the perfect harmonics in the overtone series. The relationship of one to three is such a perfect tuning relationship that it is not disturbed. And the higher relationship to higher ratios, which the four chord represents, is changed, can be altered. This can be altered without affecting this guy too much. This relationship of one to five, and here, is very strong. So if I leave this guy alone, and leave its harmony so the overtones here and the overtones in these notes agree, lock in, they're harmonically correct, you have the harmonic minor. All I want to say about this is you can use this technique to invent any kind of scale that you want. What if you want a diminished scale? And you want to figure out what notes, what's a diminished scale, and what notes will fit diminished chords? Well, what you do is you, t you sit and you write your one, four, five chords out, and you make them all diminished chords. And then you transpose them into one octave, and what you will get is a diminished scale. If you want an augmented chord, <coughs> augment chords, make them bigger than they naturally are, and figure out what an augmented scale will look like. You can do the same thing. How many augmented scales can you have? Three, five. You can make as many different augmented scales as you want. You have three chords, and you don't have to augment all three. You can augment just one of them, and that'll make some kind of augmented scale. Or if you augment two of the three, you'll get a different kind of augmented scale. You'll augment all three, you'll get a different scale. Then again, and those scales will always work with those chords. Well, it has the one, it has a third flat going up the scale, but when you come down the scale, it flats six and seven. It's really weird, but it sounds more melodic that way. Listen. different sets of chords. You have one set of chords going up and all of them are flatted coming down. You have two different ways in which you treat those chords in order to create this scale. So what I'm saying, you can mix it. The thing is, is that it's 
you can take this simple trick. You can, oh, thank you. You can take this simple trick, and you can use this simple trick any way you want to create any number of scales. Here's another way of drawing it. Here's my 135, starting on 4. This is my 4 chord. I'm starting on the 5th. That's my 5 chord. So this is my 1 chord, my 4 chord, and my 5 chord. Now we know we've got 1, 3, and 5. We just have to fill in the rest with these guys. Let's say this is the key of C. There's no sharps or flats. Everything here is natural. And I decide I want to make an augmented scale of some sort. How do you augment a chord? Well, you look up in your little chord chart there for augmented chord, and you'll find out that an augmented chord has a major third and an augmented fifth. That means the fifth has been made a half a step larger. So that's a major third. This is a perfect fifth. I have to sharpen this note in order to make that work. That means that this note has now been sharpened, right? Let's transpose that over there. Now let's look at this guy. Okay? This is a third, and there's a fifth. And that's a perfect fifth. Got to augment this fifth. Got to make it bigger. So now this note I can bring over here, like that. This, by the way, is too small. Because when I sharpen this, I made this tinier. So it ain't natural anymore. In order to get it back, I have to sharpen that. So now the distance there is like it was before. But now my distance of a fifth has been squished, right? by this. So to make my fifth perfect, I have to first put a sharp on it to make up for this, for this that I squished up there, like that. So now look, I've got three sharps here and a sharp there and a sharp there. One, two, three, four, five sharps. And if I take and transpose them across, this is my six. This is two, let's see, this is seven and this is two. So my seven is sharp and my two is sharp. And this is my four, six, one. Four is just fine. Just pull it over like that. Seven sharp, two sharp, five sharp. Oh, six. Wait, so that's one. It can't be six. That's the way this is, and I have the alternate of having one sharp. I can have this sharp or not sharp because this one got sharped here. So here's an aug some kind of augmented scale. I don't know what kind of augmented scale we call it, I guess, because we augmented all the chords, we'd have to call it a natural augmented scale. But it starts out with one, two sharp, three, four, five sharp, six, seven sharp, and one sharp on the top. I think so. Let me think. What key are we in? We're in C. So this is G, B, D. No. No. 
So, fits these chords. I could make one of these a diminished chord, could instead say, oh well, let's make that minor and let's flatten that. And now let's mi mix flats. Now the sixth here is, uh, is a flatted note and then this one could be a flatted, could be a flatted note. Now we got mixed sharps and flats. Now I have a scale that has two sharps and two flats. I wouldn't exactly know what to call it, but I know it will work. I don't know what to call it, but it will work with these chords. If I play a one chord, a one diminished, and I play a, I mean, I'm sorry, if I play a one augmented, that's a plus, a four diminished along with a five augmented chord, strange chords, this scale, whatever it is, will work. It will. Can you play it? I just, I did. Oh, well, okay. I can play, no, this one is different. This one's a... Uh, <laughs> The octave, yeah. yes. You made an intro nine scale, a nine unit octave. That's right. Sometimes some of the scales you get are not seven notes to care. Sometimes you wind up with nine note scales or six Diminished note scales. scales. Diminished tend to do that. Diminished you'll wind up with six note scales. So if you played the chords that went along with those, you could play any of those. Yes. That would sound good? You play any of these along with any of those chords and it would sound good. Yes. Exactly. That's my point. My point is, is that whenever you get a chord that's not a normal 1-3-5 chord, I mean a normal 1-4-5 chord, however that chord has been altered, the notes that it alters will be altering those same notes in the scale and creating a new scale. And indeed, scales are created because of harmonic consideration, not the other way around. And regardless of what you call the scale, I can write scales that we don't have names for, but I know that they'll work because of this 
extension of, again, I'm saying, I can take music theory and extend it to something that seems improbable, or when I write it, it looks impossible, or I don't know what to call it, but when I sound it, it makes sense. That's all that counts. What about dissonance? Well, we'll get into that in just a bit. I just want to show you that you can create these, these three basic scales, minor scales, are laid on you a lot, and most people don't know why these half steps occur where they occur. I'm, just, I'm explaining to you what no other music teacher explains. Why this happens. This is why this happens. And as a matter of fact, because this is the why, you can use that why to invent new scales. And you can make up any kind of tonality you want. Any kind of chord you run across, you just cram it in on the staff with, with your other chords, see what notes it's modified, modify those notes, and wow, you've got a new scale that fits your new chord progression. And you'll always be singing in chord or in, the, in, in key. Um, now, what makes modes? What makes modes is not everything starts on one all the time. These are all ways of finding a scale which start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. But I don't always have to start on one and end on one. Okay, here's the normal C scale, which everybody seems to know. Our universal constant, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Or we say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Like that. Right? Now, if I start on do and sing, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, we call that a diatonic major scale. But what if I start on on re and sang all the way up to re? Now the half steps you see are shifting into different places, aren't they? And I'm getting another scale. I'm getting a different scale. It's still using the do re mi scale, but it's it's not in the same arrangement that it was before. And this is called a mode. A mode. So instead of going do, I say re mi fa so la ti do re do ti la so fa mi re. Re mi fa so la ti do re do ti la so fa mi re. I just sang what is known as the Dorian Gray mode. It's the Dorian Ray mode. <laughs> the Dorian Ray mode, all we do in the Dorian mode is we start on Ray. Re, mi, re, fa, so, la, ti, do, re. So every time we go from Ray to Ray, we never age because we never really come to an end. <laughs> right? So this is the Dorian mode. And all it is, is it's still the same steps as you have in the diatonic scale, except we're starting on two and going up to two, therefore a mode of a major scale, and this mode is called Dorian. Now likewise, could I start on three and sing seven notes up to three? Could I start on the me and go up to me? And if I did, what would that be called? Well, it's called the P-H-R-Y-I-A-N mode, the Phrygian. The Phrygian mode is starting from three and going up. Mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, re, mi. So now here, here's the do, re, mi scale. second step of the scale we play, I have the Dorian mode. As a matter of fact, uh, the church of the uh, 14th century liked that one a lot. And the uh, 
Gregorian knew it is very, it's very, lots of music, lots of ecclesiastic music written in the Dorian. Actually, lots of ecclesiastic music written in all of the modes except one, which I'll explain later. It was one mode that they avoided, like the devil. But all the rest, they used pretty much. And the Dorian mode was used a lot for common song. So if I start on one, or I start on two and go up to two and back, uh, I'm singing Dorian mode. And uh, if I avoid stopping on one at all costs, and always end everything on the two, I will be singing in the Dorian mode. So let's try that. <laughs> step of the scale. Jazz musicians use this one more than anything else. From four to four. When you go from four to four, that is called L-Y-D-I-A-N. That's the Lydian mode. From four to four. From fa to fa. If you go too fa, you're in the Lydian mode. <laughs> Too far. Improvisational technique based on the Lydian chromatic concepts. You can take the Lydian mode, which is the Lydian diatonic mode, and the reason the jazz musicians like it is if that's one, that's two, that's three, that's four, that's five, you'll see the relationship from here to here is the five is sharp. And you have a natural sharp five, fifth step. So the fifth step of the Lydian scale is sh sharp. So they wind up, they wind up with their, uh, with their, um, it's easier to augment and diminish and find augmented and diminished patterns. But you can play against this by simply sharpening, raising, or lowering a single pitch somewhere. And what they do in, the, in this book is they start you out with the normal Lydian mode which they start in the key of C. What they do is they show you one, two, three, four sharp. Sorry, four sharp. Four sharp. I'm not batting right there. This one's sharp. The relationship with the fourth is sharp. Sharper than normal. So you get that tritone, they call that. The tritone that da la 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 which you hear in European uh, European uh, ambulances and uh, police cars a lot. They play that da la 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 la. They play that interval a lot. Right? They play that interval a lot. The 
this sharp fourth jazz musician like it because it's the most tense interval that we have in our system. And if I can hit that right away, I start out with the most amount of tension I can possibly have in music, and then I can back it off. Do they use it for the ambulances? Yeah, they use it for the ambulances because it has the most tension. It's the, you got to hear it. <laughs> we use it too, only we play them together. And we use them in foghorns, and we put it way down here. The most beautiful song I ever heard, Maria. Maria, I've never stopped saying Maria. Got that sharp tritone. So, uh, Lydian mode. Lydian mode is used a lot by jazz musicians because it naturally raises the fourth and it's so easy to just sharpen flat a couple of these notes in here and suddenly go into augmented and diminished. Yeah, you can just put a sharp here, put a flat there, and you're going through all the various forms of augmented and diminished scales that you can find. Okay, the next mode going from five to five is called mixolydian. The mixolydian mode is from five to five, and uh, that's a very major ballsy sounding thing too, so I don't know too many people that use it much except for marches. It's real John Philip Sousa. Sounds like the kind of major minor thing. Starts out sounding very major and then one note in there, interval sounds minor. So um, then you have the next mode going from six up. Remember I was saying all Minor music, if it's in major music, it starts on one, three, or five, but if it's a minor or blues, it starts on three or six. Well, what they're playing is the sixth mode. And the sixth mode is called the Aeolian mode. It's named after us Anglo-Saxons, I guess. I don't know where, where the, that actually came from. But it's called the Aeolian. The Aeolian, which is, I guess, a word for minor. Good, Thomas. Grab the book. Okay. So when you go from six to six, you are playing the Aeolian mode. Now the interesting thing about the Aeolian mode is... same as the natural minor mode. Isn't that interesting? I never try to remember anything I can look up or figure out. That's why I'm sometimes unsure about some of this stuff. Is the word natural for something? Yeah, what's Aeolian? Aeolian refers to um, <coughs> Thessalian Boeotia, colonized by Lesbos, or oh. colonizing Lesbos, so 
So the aeolian is the lesbian mode. The aeolian yeah. mode? Yeah. That's nice. Why is it the lesbian mode? <laughs> Women sang it. I know it was sung a lot, and they were the nuns, you know, come on, hey, a lot of this music was handed from nun to nun to nun, and if it wasn't for those nuns handing that music down, people like Mozart wouldn't have been able to hear it and write it down. And they had to pass that music on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, exactly. It's like Fahrenheit 451, you ever see that movie, where at the end of the movie everybody has to learn to become a book? That's the way life was. If you became a nun, and went into the monastery and you had a good voice, you would not just sing, but you would only sing certain things. You would not be taught the entire church liturgy. No way. If you had a good voice for a certain thing, you would be taught a certain mode to sing in with, for a certain kind of choir for a particular mass or purpose, and that's what you would specialize in. Until you're 80 years old as a gnarly old nun, you'd sing that until you got so good at it. <laughs> you pass it on to the nuns that came after. So it was handed down by word of mouth directly, like telling stories. The same way that the Africans hand their stories down, they have a storyteller in the tribe who memorizes the entire history of everybody who knew everybody. And as each succeeding generation, that new person has to learn all that old history, plus sit around and watch what's happening in his tribe, his life, add to that to tell the next person. And that's the way music was passed on for thousands of years the before writing. Dharma, yes, that's true. There were great writings of... Well, the Dharma has to be passed by direct oral transmission. Uh -huh. So even if you're studying a text literally, you have to sit through your teacher reading through the whole text so that you heard, heard, it, heard, heard it, it from someone who heard it. That's right, from someone who heard it, from someone who heard it, from someone who heard it. So the Aeolian mode, or from 6 to 6 is the same as if I had to flatten my third and flatten my sixth and flatten my seventh. See? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If I flatten the third, flatten the sixth, and flatten the seventh, as we did here in the natural minor, the Aeolian mode, the step here from one to three is where a packet happens, that's naturally minor, you see. And up here, these guys are naturally minor. Steps happening up here too. So the Aeolian mode of the diatonic scale is a minor, harmonic minor scale. There's an extra flat because <clears throat> six flat, six flat. I mean. Isn't there only supposed to be a flat between okay on that top scale between seven and eight and um, three and four? There's a packet normally, but what we're doing is flattening this note and flattening this note, so the distance between these two guys is still a whole step. All right. And the distance here is now a whole step, whole step. The half step occurs here. And a half step occurs there on that scale. Same thing happens up here though. See what I'm saying? So I can still just learn to play the diatonic scale, do re mi. And if I start on six and play up to six, I will be playing a harmonic minor scale. Therefore, I'll be playing blues. And whatever this note is, this note is A, is the note A. So the Aeolian mode of C, which is A, says that the A minor is the minor mode of C, or it's the Aeolian mode of the C. C, if I count backwards three notes basically to A, that's its minor mode. That's true for any scale. The G scale, if I want to know what G's minor mode would be, well, the sixth step of the G scale would be what? E, right? So E minor. So on a guitar, you could learn, um, let's say, the C major scale, everywhere it occurs, every note that it occurs, right. on the neck, and then from there, it depends on where you start. Start, so yes, you right, start starting on your modes will determine what scale you're in. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to figure out all these sharps and the flats in some cases, you just have to move to the mode. Which is just shifting the packets. Just shifting the packets again. You're just moving the packets to a slightly different place. So the, 
so the half step does not occur between three and four anymore. The half step in the scale naturally occurs somewhere else. And then, of course, there is now the most controversial of all modes, the one mode that no one was allowed to ride in, which was on, started on the seventh step of the scale and went up to seven, from seven to seven. And, of course, it has the name Locrian. It is the Locrian mode, or it came from the word Lucifer, which was the interval of the devil. The seventh step of the scale, the seventh son of the seventh son, the seventh overtone in the overtone chart, which begets us the minor version instead of its major version, is a misnomer. It's not a perfect universe. And the church doesn't like it not being a perfect universe. <laughs> Why God in his perfect wisdom made everything perfect. And every time they found something in nature that didn't seem logically perfect, well, nature must be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it was the seventh step of the scale. It was Lucifer. It was the interval of the devil. It was the tool of the devil. You were not allowed to play from seven to seven. Why is it wrong? <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you why. Because it creates too much sexual tension. Play it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, here, listen, if I play Do Re Mi, you feel tension? Yeah. You feel like you want me to go to resolve the tension, right? And you actually wouldn't care if I went up or down to resolve it, just as long as I went somewhere else. Let's try it again. That resolved it somewhat. Didn't resolve all of it, but it resolved some of it. I went to seven and I went back to six. And it was easier to stop on six than it was seven, because I could stop in the minor mode. And stopping in the minor mode didn't erase all the tension, it left a minor amount of it around, didn't it? When I went to one, I erased all of the tension, though, from seven. I erased all the tension when I landed on one. The seventh step of the scale, T, gives people this feeling as if it wants to lead you somewhere else. They call it the leading tone. And they've built a whole world of counterpoint philosophy on leading tone chords and on leading this and that, and leading tone phrases, and leading tone arpeggios, and leading tone... They use it to modulate. They use it for everything, in modulation, in whatever. But the church did not like people playing that mode. And they did not like them playing the seventh step of the scale, and you certainly couldn't stop there. There's that old story that Mozart's father was playing something, you know, he's playing. And then he went away. About three o'clock in the morning, Mozart woke up, ran downstairs, and went. And went back to bed. Because he just couldn't stand having that unresolved tension in him. <laughs> he couldn't sleep. He had to come down and resolve it. So uh, the church didn't like people leaving the church with such forbidden feelings. You know? So here's the seventh, the locri mode. Okay, so you see, by playing a mode then, we've created another kind of scale, and that can be thought of as a scale to generate melodies out of. So now I've shown you from the diatonic scale how to get seven others, the seven modes, and then how to create, I showed you that the Aeolian mode, or the sixth step, is also the natural minor scale, and how with all this stuff you can create other kinds of things. Now there's only one other mode, 
And that is when you start on one up here, eight, and go up to eight, of the next one, believe it or not, they call that, that's a mode, and it's called the Ionian mode. The uh, I-O-N-I-A-N, Ionian. In other words, the diatonic mode is also called the Ionian mode. And uh, there are another version of all these modes called hyper modes. What hyper mode means is you don't start on the number one and count from one to one, or you don't count from two to two, or you don't count from three to three. What you do is you start on whatever the fifth step of that mode is, and wherever that mode's five is, you break the scale in half and invert it like this. And what you get is The reason for this is actually based on music writing. If I draw up a scale, as you see, I did it just a little while ago, and let's say I put my scale, and I start the scale here, going up like I did, and this is one, and that goes up to one, but what if I start singing in the middle someplace, and sing up and down, okay? What if the first note of oh, the music is really in the middle of my scale. The problem with this is I couldn't sing down without having lots of ledger lines, right? So what they did with these modes is they broke the mode up. Let's take the Ionian mode and look at the hyper Ionian, which is the one mode. All they simply do is start on, start on five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, one, two, yeah. And then end up here. So this is really five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. See where the one is here? See? Do is right here in the middle. And starting on the fifth step of that scale, singing through Do up to the fifth step of that scale is called the hyper mode. Well, and the reason the for that is so if you start on one or three somewhere, you can sing up and sing below and wind up ending on one, because everything ends on one, no matter what mode you're in. Even if you're in a mode going from four to four, four then equals one. The fifth step of that scale, so four plus five, you know, that note would be the note that you start on. The fifth of that scale. Well, why do they bother doing that? Why don't they just call it the um? Because it's more melodic to sing up above and below it, and it fits on the staff. Can't you just call it an, um, I, I, I mean, a, a major scale? It is a major scale. It, and just say that it started on five instead of one? Well, that's what they said by using the word hypo. When they called it a hypo mode, they te they're telling you it starts on five instead of one of the normal mode. That's all, oh, that's all. That's all a hypo means in this case. So by calling it a, hy a hypo mode, all they're doing is saying instead of this mode starting on one and going up to its one, we're going to start on five.